too. Okay, so uh, I, let's get going here, shall we? Okay, I want to uh, thank and introduce uh, K.L. Wambacher, the president and GM of the Hillsboro Hops. Uh, he's been gracious enough to, to log in here and to speak about this summer of COVID and contraction. So, K.L., I'll give you the floor. Sounds good. Um, and, and Bob mentioned we have about four hours. So, <laughs> so it's um, appreciate uh, the opportunity. This, uh, this is a fun group to spend some time with, a bunch of uh, huge baseball fans and, and people that know the game really well. Um, as we're all aware, following media reports and everything else, um, the last four months has been pretty tough. Uh, starting in March when everything hit, I think for us, we were just so thankful to be a short season team. I mean, we we're always thankful to be a short season team, so we don't have to work as hard. But, uh, you know, having months um, to kind of figure this virus thing out, we figured, you know, gosh, I can't imagine that as sports were getting canceled. We just couldn't imagine a scenario where, where the summer would be canceled. We, we kept thinking and, and planning for – potentially a late start, maybe instead of starting mid-June, we start early July, uh, maybe even into August, and then we play into September. So uh, we always felt until probably, I don't know, late April, early May, we always felt that we were going to get some sort of season. Um, er early on, the, the the toughest thing was was really just the, the unknown and running parallel with the with the COVID stuff was the minor league baseball major league baseball PBA agreement that was run running concurrently to a lot of this stuff happening and so hey, you Robert know, it, can you mute your phone you're you're cutting in and out there yeah I think if everyone goes on mute it might be a little yeah better. yeah. There we go. Thank you. Um, so, um, uh, lost my train of thought. So early, early on, it was it was really just kind of trying to plan for some resemblance of a season. Um, try to communicate with our fans as much as possible. Just a lot of it was we just didn't know what was going to happen, but um, we kept. We kept saying to everyone, whatever happens, we're, we're going to make sure that we take care of you. We're, we're, our fans come first, however this all shakes out. So whether that's health and safety measures for people to come out to games and feel safe, or whether that's financially of uh, what happens if we don't play games. Um, I feel like March and April, we were probably the busiest we've ever been. And when I look back, it, it was kind of like we didn't do anything. <laughs> we didn't get anything done. But all the spreadsheets we were running, all the budget projections we were running and revising, um, all the the operational plans that we were putting together to, to run games if this pandemic was still going on, um, how we would socially distance the stadium once that became a real hot button, um, how we would sanitize things, the new cleaning protocols, just all of that stuff, and then what that would do to the budget um, positive and negatively, you know, how many fans, if we could open the gates, how many fans would be the minimum to where we could break even on the night. And so our goal was only to get to a break even point. We knew we were going to lose money, but, but we just wanted to try to brace ourselves and, and not lose as much as possible. So, um, so early on, it was, it was really just a lot of planning for what ifs. And, you know, at this point, pretty much all those plans have been scrapped. So we didn't, we didn't really have to execute any of them. Um, and then as, as things went along and then, um, you know, and then you started to realize that, that major league players association and MLB were not getting along. We were not seeing eye to eye on some, on some major issues. And so you could start to see that being drug out. And, um, and this was, I, I don't remember the timing, but it was, it was probably late April, early May, and, and that's when we realized that the, the expansiveness of minor league baseball, 160 teams in 160 markets, and then 
you know, you start to read about all the opening stuff, the opening phases that a lot of these communities were, were starting to unveil at that time. And then that's when you realize that, I mean, there's no way, like to, to be able to send out 160 teams with 100 and diff, 160 different government uh, requirements of being able to open or not open, um, it, it was just like something that there's no way that you could, you could figure that out. And then on top of that, the, the unknowns around player safety, major league teams are probably not going to send minor league players out to risk getting sick. Um, you know, because some situations they send players to might be a good situation and they trust that the organization, the minor league team is going to take care of them. Um, you know, some teams don't, don't pay that much attention to their players. And so the trust factor isn't as strong between the, the major league affiliate and, and the minor league team. Um, and then um, none of the coaches, none of the players were getting any information this whole time. They're all, you know, we're talking to our coaching staff, we're talking to former, former, former coaches, a um, few of our former players. And I mean, they're basically sitting, sitting at home in the dark. They, they have no idea what's going to happen, if they'll report to spring training, if they'll have instructs in the fall. So it's a really interesting time to sit back and, and, you know, you start to layer all the things that these major league teams were dealing with. And the minor leagues were just so far out of the picture. And so all of this really, you know, made us realize that, okay, well, now we're going to have to brace ourselves and start planning for, for, for no season. So then it was just a waiting game of waiting for who's going to announce this. Is it going to be Major League Baseball? Is it going to be Minor League Baseball? We kept joking that, you know, the Minor League Baseball office of St. Petersburg is going to send out a, a press release at like 5 o'clock on a Friday and kind of run out of the office so they don't have to deal with it over the weekend. Um, Jim knows how regular we get communication out of St. Petersburg. So that wasn't necessarily far-fetched. So it was, um, and, and then as July 4th was approaching, we're like, oh, great. They're going to do it on like July 3rd. <laughs> um, and, and time kept passing and, and just no information coming out of St. Petersburg. Um, we, we would have regular conversations. Our league president is North Johnson, who Jim knows very well. And, and North is fantastic. It was going to be his first year as our league president. We had just hired him. Um, and we've got weekly calls and, and just the information, trying to get information was, was nearly impossible. And our farm director doesn't know anything. Um, you know, none of the farm directors really were informed and, and really knew anything. They just kept telling us that, yeah, we're not sending players out. We're not sending players out. Um, and once we got to July, or uh, excuse me, once we get to June, mid-June, um, that's when we realized that we're starting to get a few phone calls. Our opening day, what, what would have been our opening day was coming up. And so we decided that, you know, well, we're just going to get ahead of this. We're going to get in front of the messaging. And we started sending out a, a weekly letter to our season ticket holders and, and, and um, not necessarily weekly, but um, I think it was bi-monthly in June. And the first letter was just tr really kind of opening up to them and just explaining where things are and that we really don't have a lot of information, even though we should. And then by the time the second letter came around, we just said, you know what, we're tired of waiting. We're, we're going to start getting a lot of refund calls. And the way our business works is we collect a lot of our season ticket money and ticket money in the fall, winter, and then into the spring. And a lot of that money is spent along the way. It's, it's kind of our cash flow, how our, how our cash flow works in a, in a fiscal year. And so by the time we get to the summer, that's when our big revenue comes in. But we've spent a lot of the money um, on giveaway items and, and merchandise and payroll and stadium um, items and league fees and, and all that kind of stuff. So all of that stuff hits us really before the summer hits. And then we have two and a half months to make money. <laughs> to hopefully cover all of those expenses that we've already um, uh, already committed to. So when this hit, we had spent all that money planning on a season, and then all of a sudden we realized there's no season. So we've got a major cash flow issue here because if all of our fans want a refund on the money they just gave, we don't have it. We have some, but we don't have all of it. And so we, we went round and round and, and figured out, you know, what is the best messaging? What can we do for fans? How can we appeal to them 
to basically let us keep the money and roll it to 2021. And in a way, we're kicking the problem down the road, um, but at least we can deal with the problem then because we're going to have a lot more nodes. We also, at the same time all of this is going on, all the, all the media reports we're hearing and the information we're getting from the, from the PBA negotiation has been they want to eliminate short season baseball. At first, that was a, that was a pretty big shock. And then it, we found out that they would elevate the Northwest League to a long season format. So, again, we still don't know if that's going to happen, when it's going to happen, if it's going to happen. But at least that gave us some information where we can plan against for 2021. So um, while this is a cash flow issue now, we, we could potentially have another 30, 35 home games next year that would help balance the budget. So we knew if we could kick the problem to 2021, we at least have a fighting chance to balance our budget then because we certainly have no chance to balance it in 2020. And so once we kind of made that decision, um, we sent a, a really open, honest, letter that came from me to, to, to all of our fans that had paid and just explained the situation and was very honest with them and very transparent, we felt. And, and we just let them know that this is our plan. We'd like to roll everything to 2021. And then we just responded to one-offs. And so, and then after we sent the letter out, then all of our reps followed up one-on-one -on -one with all our fans and just made sure they were okay with everything. We, we didn't want to you know, play hide the ball with anybody. Um, and the vast majority of people were like, you know what, we want to support you guys. You guys have been great in the community. We love coming to games. No problem. No problem. We want to help you out. We want to help you out. What, what else can we do to help you out? Oh, we can buy merchandise. Okay, I'm coming down to the shop tomorrow. Um, and so that was, you know, when, when this would have been our eighth season, and, and this would have been my 20th season, and – when you do this for a while, you, you start to, you know, you, you start to, you definitely take things for granted, but you don't realize how much the fans love the team until a situation like this happens. And, and fans have the ability to say, no, what? I want my money back. I want my money back. I want my money back. And I think if we hadn't developed a level of trust with our fans over the last seven years and, you know, really worked hard to build those relationships and provide those experiences in the stadium and try to treat people well as, as best we can. If we didn't do all that work, there's no way we'd be in the position we're in right now. Um, we had a, a 90, what was it? It was a 4.6% refund rate. So 90, 4.6. So 95.4, right? Yeah, all right, got it. Sorry, our owner is my mathematician. So but we had an over 95% success, and we called it like a retention rate of, of keeping that money to, to 2020. Um, the next closest team in our league was over 10%. So we felt really, really good about the fan support we have, and that's what really gives us a lot of, a, a lot of confidence moving forward. We, we know we have the support. It was also a wake-up call for us as well, again, you know, not to take these things for granted, not to take um, fans for granted. And, and what else can we do? We spent the last two weeks talking about what else can we do to improve our experience? What else can we do to improve our season ticket experience? Uh, what else can we do to show value to our fans and to our, to our ticket holders that are spending money with us? Um, they're there for us now when we need them. And now we need to be there for them in the future. And so that's been, um, that's really been the process. I think the most difficult thing during the process is the unknown of 2021. And I know um, uh, Mr. McCurdy in the, in the Pioneer League is, is facing uh, even greater challenges than, than our league is. Um, but again, we don't know. All, all we know is, is, information we were given in the fall, which was, you know, seems like years ago, <laughs> even though it was months ago. Um, and then and then basically media reports speculating what's going to happen. We get some updates here and there from the negotiating committee, but we don't get a lot of information like, like we would think we would. 
I mean, normally in this time, we're starting to already get our 2021 season. So we're, we're kind of coming up on the mid-season mark. And we're now, you know, once we get into August, we, we start to switch gears for 2021 as we finish out 2020. And so um, it's a really interesting time right now because, I mean, I couldn't guarantee you we were even going to play in 2021 at this point. We think we are. Um, and you know, we think they'll get a new PBA done with the with Major League Baseball, but um, you know, Major League Baseball could basically sit back and just let the agreement expire in in October, uh, September, uh, September 15th. I don't know when it is. Sometime in mid or end of September, so they could just let the agreement expire, and then and then it could even become a free for all at that point. Like, I mean, that's probably not going to happen, but. You know, the, you get to the point now, we haven't had an update from the PBA in about two months. And silence is, silence is deadly when it comes to stuff like this, because now your mind's spinning and, and, and everyone's mind is spinning because um, pretty much all of our livelihoods are based around this agreement for the most part. I mean, we'll all, we'll all survive with or without it, obviously, but um, We've, we've never had a moment like this where we don't know what's going to happen next season. We don't know what minor league baseball is going to look like. Um, don't know what major league baseball is going to look like. Um, are they going to get a season in, you know, is it going to get canceled mid season? Um, it's, it's such a, it's such a strange time to, to live through. Um, when this all started, we, we, about a week into it, after the shock of everything shutting down, um, we did a Zoom with our staff. We shut our office down. We did a Zoom with our staff. And we said, all right, this is going to be difficult. We have three options here. Anytime there's a crisis, you have three options. You can fight, you can flight, run away, or you can freeze. We're going to fight. And, and we're going to have a positive attitude every day. Um, we're going to think about what we can do, not what we can't do. Um, and that's, and that fighting mentality has been our mentality for the last three, four months, four months now, I guess. And it will continue to be our mentality as we go into the summer, even though we, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know what we're planning for. Um, but every staff meeting we have, we're, we're talking about things, things that we can do. What can we do? Um, let's not, let's not focus on the things that we can't do. Um, we've tried to do events at the ballpark. Um, drive-in movies, or we tried to do a drive-in fireworks for 4th of July, um, and everything has been shut down by either the county, by the state, or by the city. <laughs> um, and, and we finally, I, I love this about our team, because we were probably shut down on, I don't know, 15 or 20 events, event ideas. And over since, since, since June, mid-June, until about a week ago. And we kept coming up with ideas. Our team kept coming up with ideas. They, they, they didn't let that beat them down to where they just said, all right, forget, we, we can't do anything. Um, and we finally had an idea to do day camps. We found out day camps were approved. There's not a lot of day camps going on. So we're gonna turn Ron Tonkin Field into a day camp center, basically, for four hours a day, for five days a week, kids eight to, what is it, six to 12, something like that. Um, our front office is going to turn into camp counselors, and um, and we're just going to have camp. It's going to be centered around baseball, but there will also be arts and crafts and activities. And um, so it's been really cool to see our team be continue to be proactive in what can we do. And we finally got it approved by the city and the county two days ago. Uh, actually, it's Friday. Um, and so now they're full speed ahead to to run these run these camps in August, which is which is which is awesome. But I think for us, the, the key getting through this is how do we become a better organization as a result? So it's really easy to look at a situation like this and just dwell on it and, and have a woe is me attitude and, um, and just, you know, just kind of freeze up and not do anything. And, and there are a lot of teams that are doing that. Um, I have friends that, that run teams that, that have kind of just – laid off all their staff and they're just waiting it out. And so we call that a, a freeze mentality. We've kept everyone on our staff. Um, we, 
instead of doing layoffs, we did um, a pay cut. So we did pay cut across the board. Our, our low level, lower, lower paid employees were cut um, the minimum amount that we could. Higher level employees were, were, were given significant cuts. Um, I volunteered for a 50% cut in my pay just to be, just to kind of lead by example. And, uh, um, you know, so it's, it's going to hurt for a while for us, but at the end of the day, we kept our, we're able to keep our team together, which is our number one goal in this was keep our team together. So when we do get out of it, we do get through it. Now we're ready to go. We don't have to rebuild. And, and like a lot of teams are going to have to do. Um, and then, and then the other thing is, is and, and part of that strategy was also office culture. We, we've had a very good, strong office culture for the last, well, um, for sure for the last few years. But we wanted to, to, is there a way to take a global pandemic and improve our office culture through this? And again, trying to think of what can we do, not what can't we do. And so retaining everyone was part of that culture initiative. And then, um, and then just the attitudes we have in meetings, the attitudes we have, we got our office back open and, and we're rotating people 50% in, 50% out. Um, and just getting people together more, uh, of course, six feet away. And we did uh, some shopping experiences for season ticket holders that had, that had paid and are allowing us to roll their money to 2021 where they basically get a VIP shopping experience. They get a uh, 25 or 30% discount. They get to come into the store. We've got the trophy since we, we won in 2019. Um, and they get to take a picture of the trophy. They re can request bar barley to be there. We'll throw someone in the barley suit for them. Um, and they and we, it, we have only one staff member that's there. They wear a mask. The, the people that come wear a mask. We sanitize everything in between visits and they get their own 30 minutes. And um, so we've done quite a few of those the last two weeks and that's been a lot of fun mainly just to see people come to the ballpark um, and just be happy. They're just, they're, they're happy to take a picture with Barley. They're, they're happy to, you know, some of them spend money and some don't. I mean, it's not gonna, you know, swing our bottom line by doing things like this, but it's engaging for the fans and it's giving people a reason to, to come out to the ballpark, which I think in baseball, baseball to me has always been that sport of going out to the ballpark is almost better than watching the game. It's just, it's the atmosphere. It's it's just being around the ballpark, you know. Before all the artificial turf, the fresh, the fresh cut grass, um, the sights and sounds, the, the hot dogs. I mean, there's so many vivid things you think about when you think about a ballpark, um, and it's and it's different than any other sports stadium, in, in, in my opinion. And so, just finding ways to get people to come out to the ballpark, even if it's one by one, and and providing those that. Uh, everyone in, in baseball and my baseball says you're in the memory making business. We, we, we uh, 38 memories every, every summer and we can't create those memories with our games, but what can we do to where our fans look back and say, I remember 2020, God, that, that year sucked when we, we didn't have hops baseball, but remember that time we got to go out to the ballpark and just, you know, hang out on the field and, and see barley and, and kind of have our, have it to ourselves that day, and, you know, try to create those memories to where they're still looking back on 2020 with some fondness. Um, so I think, I think there was a question come up in the chat. Uh, um, is there another in Northwest League team that's done something you envy or something you wish you'd done? Um, no doubt. Um, I think, Pioneer League, which, which Jim is in, is, is a very strong league. Our league, in my opinion, is a very strong league. Um, we have some amazing operators. Uh, Alan Benavides and Eugene wins tons of promotional awards. And they call them golden bobbleheads. Um, they, uh, I would say one of the things that I thought was brilliant um, recently was the Durham Bulls. And they came out with a t-shirt just probably a week or two ago that said 2020, that's some bull shirt. Because they're the Durham Bulls, little Durham Bulls logo. And they sold thousands of shirts. <laughs> um, and Mike Burling, who, who, who's been in Durham forever, he's a, he's a really good guy. I've known Mike for a while. And um, so I think from a most recent standpoint, 
they were the first to come out with something 2020 related. So it was very topical, top of mind, and, and resonated not with just their fans, but with, with so many different fans. And they were probably one of the only teams that could do that because, because of the movie Bull Durham, so many people know about the Durham Bulls. So um, I thought that was, that was pretty good. Uh, perfect, another one came in as well. How has the Latino promotion been received? Um, good logo. The, uh, so we did, a, we did part of a national effort with minor league baseball called the Copa de la Diversión, and, and it's really a drive to, um, to uh, diversify fan bases. And, you know, they had all the stats of communities that have a certain amount, a certain percentage of Latinos, and then the stadium has hardly any. And um, so it was a very intentional, research-driven campaign that was to diversify the crowd. So the first year we did it, um, we took minor league baseball's advice and we did the lupulos, which is Spanish for hops. Made, made sense to us, a bunch of English-speaking white guys. Um, but it did not resonate at all in the Latino community. <laughs> Um, a lot of people were like, what's a lupulo? <laughs> like they, they didn't know it. So we're like, oh crap, well, this didn't go well. Um, so when that, when that didn't land well, we, we pivoted and we did about a two month search and we tried to find someone that has been in the Latino community for, for a number of years that fit our culture, bilingual, obviously. Um, and we found um, a kid named Yvonne Hernandez. And Yvonne was going to PCC at the time, a community college here in town, a very gregar gregarious, um, great speaker, tons of energy, just, just an enthusiastic personality. We're like, all right, this is our guy. And so we hired him, brought him on board. He knew nothing, hardly anything about baseball. Um, actually didn't know a lot about many sports. Um, but we brought him up to speed right away. And, and that first summer he was with us, he came to me and he said, Kale, the lupulos is not resonating well in, the, in, our, in my community. I'm like, yeah, I know. Uh, so can we change the brand? I said, yeah, absolutely. So we went through about a month long process and we came up with Sonia Doris. Sonia Doris to Hillsboro, uh, and it's Spanish for dreamers. And at the time, it was kind of on the tail end of a lot of the DACA and dreamers talk with, with Trump and the government and the funding and, and the budget and all that kind of stuff. And so we spent some time talking about, all right, um, you know, at that time, teams were not getting involved in politics. And we certainly have no interest in getting involved in politics. But we spent more and more time talking about what's the right thing to do here? Do we, do we want to worry about politics or do we just want to do the right thing? Uh, we knew that that name would resonate in the Latino community. We also knew, and, and we spent a lot of time talking about dreams. What is it, if, if that wasn't going on in the government and someone heard the word dreamers, like what is it you think? You think, you think positive. You think as a kid dreaming to play pro baseball, you think of um, you know, the, the guys that are on our team, their dream was to play pro baseball and they're living out their dream. You think of a dream to be a firefighter, a doctor, um, you know, everyone has a dream of what they aspire to, to become. And kids coming to our ballpark, they all have a dream. Of, and so then we started seeing this term as a unifier and, and you know, build, build bridges, not walls. And, and this, this doesn't have to be just Latino based. This can be really a unifying word. This, all, this brings all of us together. We're all dreamers. And we came up with Toto Somos Sony Doris, which is we're all dreamers. And so then once we wrapped our heads around that, we basically said, all right, well, if we get pushed back on the political stand, we're just going to stand our ground because we, we feel like this is the right thing to do. And um, it, it went off with a bang. The logo was awesome. Um, we have this Al Brihe character as the logo. It's kind of a coyote that's like looking up, kind of like a dream. Um, we put the flame of the Statue of Liberty in his tail, so no one really knows that, but there's, kind of, there's some symbolism within the logo itself, which is pretty cool. Um, the diamonds stand for a baseball diamond, but also a graduation cap. And we had 
those kind of sparkled in too, because in the Latino culture, your dream is to get your education and get your degree, your college degree. Um, and so a lot of that symbolism was, was really important too, as we go out and we tell this story in the community gives us something to talk about, but the brand was, was huge. Um, last year was our second year of it. I believe, yes. Second year. The years are running together. And um, we had a ton of Latinos on our team last year and they loved the uniforms. And then um, we won and we, we ended up going, I think six and oh or seven and oh with the Sony Doors uniforms last year. And so we made the playoffs and we got to game one of the playoffs. And our manager was Latino, Javier Colina from Venezuela. And he comes up and he, he calls me in his office, says, hey, KL, um, I know we're supposed to wear the home whites tonight, but can we wear the Sony Doors jerseys? I was like, ah, we, you know, we really want to wear the home whites. I mean, the game's going to be on, on TV and da, 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 da. And, and we really want to show off the brand. And he goes, I know, KL, we're six and out in the Sony Doors, or seven and out, whatever it was, in the Sony Doors. I was like, well, I'm not going to say you have to wear hops and then we lose and it's my fault. So wear whatever you want. <laughs> uh, sure enough, they won. <laughs> we won. Um, and we ended up wearing them every game at home. We wore them and we went undefeated at home in the playoffs last year, which was, which was really, really cool. And so the, the rings that we wore, or the rings that we awarded for the, for the players, the championship rings, we ended up putting the Sonia Doris logo on the ring, which is the first time we've done that, which was, which was really cool. So, um, yeah, it's been, been a really, really, really neat story. Uh, another comment just came through, too. The, the Emeralds released the T-shirt, uh, Owen76 COVID sucks. Another Northwest Lake social distance champion. Yeah, they're they're pretty creative. I, I'm pretty sure they used an illegal vendor for that too. I don't think it was a licensed vendor. Uh, there was another team that did uh, the undefeated tour, and they did a T-shirt that looked like a concert, like the old concert T-shirts that had the the tour schedule. And so they they had that on the back, and basically undefeated for the 2020 season. <laughs> so, I mean, at least teams are trying to have some fun with it. Um, hopefully I hit on, on some of the things you were, you were looking for, Bob, at least maybe yeah. one of the things you were looking for, but yeah. Um, can you, uh, or, or maybe anybody else that'll chime in in terms of contraction, do we know what's going on with, with, with you and with the other teams in the league there? Are there some, uh, do we have any idea at all other than just rumors? Just, um, I mean, the short answer is no, we don't know. Um, what we think is going to happen based on what we've been told is the Northwest League would become a six-team league. So we would lose two teams. Um, again, the, the last information we had on what teams were in, what teams were out, was back in the fall. And so ever since then, there's just rumors of, of, of what's going on. Back then, um, the teams were Tri-Cities and Salem. But, I mean, anyone's guess. I mean, you know, Boise's been trying to build a new stadium forever. Boise's really the outlier in our travel market. Um, so, you know, if, if Major League Baseball is worried about travel on players and, and health and safety, which they say they are, um, I don't know why they would cut Boise and not Tri-Cities because Tri-Cities right in the middle and, and, and they're a great travel partner for a lot of teams. They're also spending $2 million on their facility with building the batting cages and everything else, putting new lights last year. So um, a lot of it doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense. And a lot of what they tell us is important to them ends up not being the, the root of, of some of their decision-making. Uh, so, is, so is it possible that a team now that might think that they're not going to be contracted, but financially are really struggling in the midst of this, that they end up folding and maybe some of the other teams that were considering being contracted might be able to come back in if they have a more stable financial setup. Um, I mean, I'm sure pretty much anything's possible at this point. Um, I, I certainly don't have my pulse on the majority of minor league baseball, but my sense is every team is going to get to next year. Um, I think every team did the rollover with money to 2021 for the most part. And so 
that's what's going to help them survive and get get to 2021. I don't think any of the teams in minor baseball will go bankrupt. Um, a lot of them got the PPP, the pay, pay, payroll protection, um, which was a lifeline for us. I mean, at the time, you know, we're running full payroll. We're, we're trying to prep for a season because, again, this is March and we don't play till June. And we're thinking, oh, we're going to have a season. Like, I was Mr. Optimistic and – of course, we're going to play. I mean, maybe we start a little bit late, but we're going to play. And, and so having that um, March and then into um, April and May, having basically April and May covered from a payroll standpoint was, was huge because that gave us the, the time period to make decisions financially. Um, and just about I, – I saw the report. I think it was like 120 teams got payroll protection, something like that. <clears throat> they are working on some more legislative – issues right now in, in Congress in, in DC for either minor league baseball teams or just businesses in general that had their budgets affected and their financials affected. So I think there could be some more relief coming out for, for teams. But um, but yeah, I think I think they'll all get through. I think Major League Baseball might be hoping that some teams go out of business to make their to make their jobs easy. Um, but um, and, you know, that's, that's another unfortunate thing, I think, with COVID and the timing of everything. I feel like minor league baseball was making some progress with fighting them on the contraction. And, you know, they're getting Congress involved and Bernie Sanders is involved. And um, it was becoming very public and major league baseball was looking very bad. And, and that was the whole strategy, obviously, with minor league baseball to try to try to make them look uh, – make them look terrible and kind of turn the public on. And that strategy might have worked. But once COVID happened, everyone's attention got shifted. And in my league baseball basically lost any leverage that they had, which was very little in the first place. It's it's terrible. I mean I I you know I I'm I'm thankful that we haven't been on the contraction list. But then again, I mean Major League Baseball could come back and wipe out the Northwest League completely. It wouldn't necessarily surprise anyone um, just be, because there's not a lot of rhyme and reason to, to some of the things we've heard. There's, again, what they'll tell you doesn't line up with what they're actually doing. So, um, you know, they talk about growing the game. Well, cut the 40 markets of minor league baseball, which is those fans' access to major league baseball, doesn't seem like you're trying to grow the game. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. Um, you know, so again, I don't, that, that's what they're saying and what they're doing sometimes is, is two different things. I do think that, I do think it was time to probably look at the model and say, is this the right model? Um, and I think there needed to be greater accountability to minor league teams. And, and that's probably one point that I will agree with Major League Baseball. And I think we have a lot of facilities that, it just haven't been kept up and they haven't been kept up because there's, there's been very little accountability over the years. Um, and, and there's no penalties really. Um, we're a member of a soccer league now through the Portland Timbers that they were running their business operation and, and seeing their facility standards and the penalties that they institute, if you don't meet their facility standards, there's teeth behind it. Um, in baseball, there really is no teeth. Uh, so, you know, if your facility doesn't meet major league standards, they'll just kind of give you a variance and they, they just kind of kick the can down the road. And then after, you know, again, you get to five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Now all of a sudden you look at that facility and they're like, how did this happen? But it's, it's just that, um, you know, the, the, the just slow death where it's just little bite, little bite at a time. And, and so for me, when facility standards came up, I was like, okay, I, I agree with this. I, we, we need to take a look at facility standards again, bring them up to speed. I think the last time they were updated was like 90, it was in the 90s. Um, and there's been minor, minor modifications, but the game and the money is so different now than it was in 94, 96, whenever these original, these, these last standards were. So, um, but never in our wildest mind did we think they would chop 40 teams. And, and you know, hopefully, there's a way to still battle out of that, but um, it doesn't look good. Well, you know, the, the pickles 
I'm sure you know that that the uh, what is it? The West Coast League is not stop play this year, and you know the pickles. They were really working on like doing a lot of the same kinds of things. Well, we're, we're going to still play. They were planning on playing for as long as it was reasonable at all, more than it was kind of unreasonable, really, um, to have socially distanced and to have you know a minimum amount of people there. But they've or they organized like a small. And now they call it the Wild West League. With like there's four teams playing, you know, uh, there. Uh, it, it would seem like there's, if Major League Baseball, you could have an independent league, you know, in some ways, with with enough uh, facilities in some towns that, that had a lot of community support, you know. I mean, I got to think if you're having a nice summer, one of those nice summer nights in, in Missoula, where it's light until about 10 o'clock at night, and you really feel like, oh, man, we're going to go to the ballpark tonight. You know, mm -hmm. we're going to sit out there. Ballpark. I don't care if it's like a collegiate. I don't care if it's one of these aluminum bat leagues. You know, <laughs> yeah, I I would go to go to see that baseball game. You know, after a while there. That's why I think, like all the teams in our league, we're we're gonna we're gonna figure something out. We're gonna survive. Um, you know, if we have to turn into an independent league, we'll do that. But um, that's that would certainly be an option for us. And. Um, it's a lot more expensive because now you're paying your players, where obviously Major League Baseball pays their players now. But um, you know we're we're gonna we're gonna be resilient. I mean we've we've got a bunch of resilient operators in in Park West League, um, other leagues like the Pioneer League with 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 President McCurdy here and 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 others. I mean we've got a lot of good operators in this game that they're they're gonna figure it out and and. You know, who knows? Maybe Major League Baseball comes in with these sweeping changes, and then a year from now, all the Major League owners are like, what is this? <laughs> um, you know, and, and maybe they make a change at that commissioner spot, and, and we kind of go back to kind of go back to the drawing board. I mean, again, I, I think at this point, like, anything is possible. It's, it's, it's so wide open. It's, uh, it's really a crazy time to um, to, to, to be on, to be with a team because you just, there's, there's a million different scenarios that could happen from here. Yeah, one thing I'm concerned about Northwest league going the long season, if they only have six teams, and I also heard it would, it would be long, but not 144 games. It'd be 120 to 130. Still, you're playing each other 20 times. That would be a lot. What I'm really concerned about is Eugene. So now college ball, okay, if there's long season, now they're gonna to have to start earlier. And who has, who's gonna have priority of scheduling of that ballpark, U of O. Yep. And then, now I heard college wants to expand into June and July. That's gonna make it worse. So. That's one, um, and, and they're working on that with the Ducks right now. And, they're realizing that, uh, yeah, there's a good chance the Ducks are going to have priority. So, I mean, they might be playing like 10 a.m. games, uh, 11 a.m. games, just to get the game in. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be a challenge for them. Concessions and stuff, because the M's can have beer. U of O can't, and different prices for popcorn and hot dogs and advertising on the outfield walls. There's a, a lot of stuff there. I really hate to see what's happened with the Pioneer League there, Jim. Man, this is terrible. A lot of history back in 1939 in that league. I hope it doesn't go away. Uh, we, uh, we do not plan to go away. I want to echo the um, statement uh, to Kay Al made that uh, uh, we don't know what it's going to look like at this point in time, but uh, we plan to be there. Um, and you're right, started in 19. 1939 and have a grand history. I will say that sometimes it, I, I read comments and maybe Baseball America or something about the Pioneer League stadiums and want to point out that all of our stadiums have been built since the specs have been put into place and have been built to specs. We have a AAA stadium in Colorado Springs, which certainly meets the standards. The Billings uh, ballpark was voted by Baseball Ballpark Digest, and I believe as being the best facility in the short seasons at one point. Uh, for one year, you've got the great Ogden uh, Stadium, 
we got good Montana uh, stadiums have been built all down I-15. Idaho Falls has suites and the like. Uh, um, the uh, Orem facility has uh, been interesting, but it is, it's on a college campus and it's just really nicely built uh, facility. So all of ours meet the specs. And if uh, we have, uh, and I think KL is probably accurate, the major leagues will plan to uh, increase those particular standards. I understand they were going to be uh, eating facilities for players and various things. And we will uh, we'll meet those if uh, we're called upon to do so. Yeah, and I think to, to that, to echo uh, Jim's point there, I think that's the frustration that a lot of teams have is they keep talking about different facility standards. And so all of us are like, okay, bring it on. I mean, if, if but give us a chance. If you want to set new stands for a facility and that's your hot button issue, then give our teams a chance to meet those standards. And, you know, we don't know what they're going to be. There's been rumors out there, um, but we don't know what they're going to be. And so I think, you know, to just cut 40 teams without even giving them a chance to meet what this future is going to look like, because there, there might be teams that say, you know what, that's going to cost me $5 million and I'm out. I can't. I can't do that. I can't justify it. Which, which, but, but at least they had the opportunity, and um, that's where a lot of the frustration is going to going to come. Yeah. I have a copy of the standards, and what I see, and I carry them with me because I'm one of the nerdiest nerds there are. So I got to count how many square feet of concession counter space there is per seat in this ballpark. But it seems that anything that the fans can see is up to par. The things that need to get better are the size of the locker rooms and the training facilities and stuff like that. So that's where I think the problem would be and hard to expand on some of that. Mm -hmm. No room. Yeah, that's going to be a challenge in a lot of ballparks. Like Vancouver, for example, old, old ballpark, Napa Stadium, beautiful park to watch a game. Uh, but their player facilities are, are extremely inadequate. And they know that, and they're willing to make the investments that they that they need to, um, but it, it's going to be a major challenge. Uh, we did have a uh, comment come in, which I thought was an interesting one. I believe, uh, I believe low minor league hockey players are unsalaried. Would that be an option for maintaining minor league baseball? Um, uh, possibly. I mean, I think um, – I mean, really, you're seeing that with the Great West League or the West Coast League, the College Wood Bat Leagues. Those are amateur players. Um, the low minor league hockey, to my knowledge, I haven't worked in that in, in that arena, but um, my knowledge is those are still amateur players. So that's why they're not getting paid. I think once you cross that threshold of being professional versus amateur, um, that's where the pay comes in. So for us, I think, having the professional baseball has always been very, very important to our business and has been our differentiating factor. I mean, the difference between us and the pickles, we're a professional team, they're an amateur team. And so um, to me, I think it's worth the investment to pay the players to have that professional label versus dropping down um, to an amateur league. Um, but, uh, but it's certainly, again, I, I think, if, if we're not looking at all options, um, I can tell you, I think you can make more money at the college with bat league. So, um, you know, that wouldn't be so bad, but, uh, but again, I, all options are on the table at this point. The, the key is keeping baseball in our communities. I mean, Jim mentioned earlier with the Pioneer league and they're going to be there. This team's going to be there and, and we're going to find ways to bring fans out. So, we just have a minute or two. What's the best possible scenario that you would like to see? For, for us? Year? Yeah. For, for us personally? Uh huh. That, what's a realistic, like, oh, this, everything's kind of turned out well, you know? What's the best scenario you could I think I have, I have spent 19 years avoiding long season baseball, not going to AAA or AA because I only wanted to work 38 games. Uh -huh. um, so it pains me to say this, but the best possible scenario is for, for us to move to a long season format, start in April, like the rest of the long season teams, 
and play a 65 to 70 game home season. So 140 games or so total. Um, remain an eight league, eight team league, which we don't know if that's likely, but remain an eight team league to, to Bob's point about playing everyone so many times. We're going to play everyone so many times anyway with eight teams. Bring that down to six teams. Now it's like, my gosh. Um, but that gives us the, the best opportunity to make money. Um, we have some pretty lofty goals and vision for what we do from a facility standpoint in the future, whether it's building a new facility or, or, or making major modifications to our existing facility, but spending 30, 50, $80 million on a facility that would be privately financed. Um, and we can do that even quicker with a long season format with more days to make money. Um, it's hard to justify a $50 million uh, um, project with 38 days to make money, 38 games. But, you know, now all of a sudden if we have 65 or 70 and we can build the right premium areas and suites and group spaces and, and uh, bars and stuff like that, we feel like it pencils out pretty, pretty quickly. So, um, you know, for us, it's long-term viability and, and the greatest viability would come from a long season format. Um, it's five o'clock, so uh, unless there's no more questions, I think we'll say thank you to everyone. KL, especially, we very much appreciate your spending time with us. And uh, if anyone has anything else there, if not, we will say goodbye. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Great okay. to see everyone. Thanks for having yeah. me. I really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Thank okay. You okay. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. Good. All right. So long, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye.